Thank you for joining us for another episode. Just to remind you, our friend of the show, Michael David Wilson, the host of This Is Horror. He has a writing and editing consultation service to people he has worked with. Worth noting is Josh Mellerman of Bird Box and David Moody. For more information, go to michaeldavidwilson.co.uk slash editing. And welcome to another episode of Dead Headspace. This is a part of Silver Shamrock's Horrorcast, a podcast network that includes Killing Time with Silver Shamrock and Unbearing the Dead, where we exhume classic horror paperbacks for the new generation. I'm your host, Patrick R. McDonough, joined always by my co-host, Brian LaFaro. Say hi, Brennan. Hello, everybody. And today, we are talking with the author of She Ride Shotgun, amongst many other books and credits to his name, Jordan Harper. Say hi, Jordan. Hi, everybody. And normally we would ask what got you into horror, but you know what, man, for you, you're best known for writing crime fiction full of brutality and violence. Um, and my, not kissing your ass, but you have quite the hand for a magnificent way of creating ultra horror. So I'm wondering if you actually have any influences from the horror genre in any media form. Oh yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I grew up, uh, the first author I probably truly loved who I read more than one book by was Stephen King. Um, and I read those books a lot of times. I, uh, I don't know how usual this is among writers, but I am somebody that from a very young age, like compulsively reread and still do compulsively reread books. So, you know, those early Stephen King books, everything from, you know, Salem's Lot's probably still my favorite through, you know, it and the Tommyknockers and into the beginning of the, the, um, Gunslinger Dark Tower series were are books that I have read. I mean, some of them I've probably read 20 plus times. Um, and you know, starting probably in sixth grade. Um, and from there I uh I went to trauma, which was probably my other really big horror. I don't even know if you can call trauma horror. I don't know what you call it, but uh I was very into trauma as a as like a 11 through 14 year old through today honestly but i'm not i'm not familiar with that brennan are you no i'm not i'm not sure that oh uh trauma was the uh the film studio that uh well they came to fame during the toxic avenger um, oh oh gotcha and all of all of those sequels and and all the way through tromeo and juliet which was a really gross um transgressive version of romeo and juliet that was actually written by a pre-fame james gunn um oh shit really yeah it's really i mean it's not for everybody nothing trauma does is for everybody uh but it's really worth checking out it's weird and funny and and sort of artsy in its own way but um and, and yeah incredibly violent and 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 scatological and and things like that but uh, i was very into that as a kid toxic avenger was kind of one of those uh you can you can say it was like a superhero movie but like Obviously, it, it would lean more into, uh, I guess, the horror and uh, absurdist genres or whatever, wherever you want to categorize it. Brennan, um, take over, sir. I, I want to talk about your rereading. That really piqued my interest because, you know, you said, oh, I don't know how many people do this. And, you know, of course, we, we've, we the people who dive deep into King have typically hit Salem's lot and it, you know, multiple times. But 20, that's that's a big ass number. <laughs> Um, yeah. So I, I'm kind of curious when you reread, is it, you know, just for love of the story? Is it to visit familiar characters? Are you picking them apart and kind of using them for inspiration? Uh, you know, how do you how do you kind of handle a reread, I guess, is the question. Well, you know, this is in, and not to make this my therapy session, but like I, uh, I I'm an anxious person and I've only recently learned this, that that compulsively rereading. I'm also a rewatcher, a compulsive Rewatching is actually a self-soothing mechanism that anxious people sometimes use uh, because you know what's coming. You won't be surprised. You can just get locked into a story. And um, I certainly didn't think that at the time. At the time, it was just, I really love this. I want to reread it. And, um, and so I would just go again and again. I remember it started when I was very young with a biography of Crazy Horse that we had at my elementary school library and Harriet the Spy and Tom Sawyer. And then just through today that, uh, you know, I almost always have a book going that I uh, that I have read before. Um, right now, it's usually a James Elroy book. Um, so I'm doing The Big Nowhere right now by James Elroy. Um, 
but uh, no, so it's one of the things where I think it has helped my writing a tremendous amount, but I don't think it's a like a lesson I could teach someone else. So if I told a young writer, oh, you need to read, you know, LA Confidential 25 times um, to learn how to do really rapid prose, I don't think it would work because they would be forcing themselves to do it where this was something that my mind just wanted to do. And so that's what my mind did. And, and it's just a weird little like um, quirk of my mind. And uh, you certainly do learn. I think the thing you learn through rereading more than anything is um, the language. You really get the language burned into you. So, um, you know, it's, it's I, I contribute a lot of my ability to have to be like a, a pro stylist to the fact that I, I do that. And, you know, speaking of um, anxiety contributing to that reread, now, forgive me if I'm putting words in your mouth, but it sounds like there's a certain level of comfort there. Um, you're revisiting a familiar story and it, you know, alleviates a little anxiety because you know what's going to happen, you know what to expect. How do you kind of balance that? I mean, horror is about unsettling, about discomfort. How do you balance comfort with discomfort there? Oh, well, I mean, I, again, it, it's uh, fiction in, in any form, if it's like, you know, the, the hard-boiled crime or, or horror is about safely experiencing things that would be absolutely horrible to experience in real life, right? And, and that's why I don't put any kind of truck into any, you know, association between real-world violence and, and violence and art or, or, you know, being a fan of those things. I actually think that it's a very safe way to experience those emotions. And it doesn't mean that you don't have those emotions. It means that you have them in a safe way where there's always kind of that backstop that you know very well, this isn't really happening. Um, and I think that is like one of the, like the real benefits of, of this kind of art is the ability to, to go places that you really, it wouldn't be fun to go. I, I sometimes people criticize like crime fiction for glorifying criminals. Um, uh, you know, by and they're not being realistic. They they make the violence you know artsy, and it's like, well, you know, it's not realistic. Real crime is incredibly sad. Um, Ninety five percent of the time, it's done out of desperation or poverty, or some kind of imbalance. It, it's not something that you you know a a perfectly honest crime story would most of the time just be very sad and, and wouldn't be fun to experience. And obviously, anything in the horror genre would be exactly the same as like, oh, my God, 12 people were were killed by a thing from beyond. If you had to deal with like all of their families experiencing that grief and, you know, the actual fact of death, it would be like a real uh, I mean, it would be horrific and in a way that I, I mean, obviously, it's horror. It's supposed to be horrific, but it would be truly you know, mind rending as opposed to being able to experience, you know, questions of morality and violence, you know, from a safe place. Um, so I think these are art forms that are really good for anxious people. That's a really interesting way to look at it. I, I, I like that a lot. So in your own work, uh, you know, and not to say you can't do both, but would you lean towards saying that you write to entertain people or to challenge people? I have this thing that I say in, in writer's rooms a lot, and it's, it's based on like kind of an out of date meme at this point, but it's um, por que no las dos, um, or why not both? And I'm a huge, I don't know if you remember that meme, it was from some like Mexican food ad where like, I don't remember what the product was, but it was something like, should we put salsa on this or should we put cheese on this? And some little girl goes, por que no las dos? And then you find out they have salsa cheese in a can that you just pour it. Um, but it, there's something about that um, that I really like as, as like an artistic guidepost of like, I don't know why we don't try and do all the things all the time. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't want to make something that's entertaining. And I don't know why you wouldn't want to make something that's like challenging and, and interesting. And I really don't like to think that, that that has to be a dichotomy. And most of my favorite artists are people who kind of live in that middle space, anyone from, you know, David Lynch to uh, Pantos Cosmatos to Michael Mann are all people who are making extremely interesting, challenging things that are also really, really fun. Because to me, the, the idea that you don't have to entertain people is uh, frankly, like pretentious and insulting. Like, because who do you think you are that you have some like, a lesson to impart to people without putting any sugar around it, you know, that you don't. Uh, um. <laughs> that's a hilarious way to put it. I can hold it in. <laughs> oh, oh, that's fine. Um, I just, um, 
you know, the, the more that I, I work and the longer I've been, and I've been doing this for a really long time in one form or another, um, I really think the only goal for a storyteller, and I've worked in TV, I've kind of worked in movies, um, and then obviously I work in fiction, um, is all people want is a little uh, to be taken into a dream. That's all people want when they sit down is to kind of be removed to a place and, and to be locked in. And, and I know that, um, well, we're on camera now, but this isn't a visual medium. So I, I'll say what I mean. But uh, when I am watching a movie in the movie theater and I really get into it, I do this thing where I lean forward and kind of make a temple with my hands and I'm looking up at the screen. And when I do that, what that means is I'm completely locked in. Like, oh, fuck, this is a good movie. <laughs> and I honestly think that as a writer, your only goal or filmmaker, whatever, your only goal should be to trigger that reaction in somebody. And to do that, you do have to entertain. You also have to have a theme. I think, you know, the theme to me is like a baseline. It's something that like deepens and enriches the story, but it doesn't necessarily you don't want a song that's just a baseline. I mean, or I guess some people do, but that's a very niche thing. But, um, and you can have a song without a baseline. Um, when or Doves you cry. don't need any basis ever, especially you, Brennan. <laughs> <laughs> that He's wasn't a even a good cheap shot. <laughs> Sorry, I, I cut you off, Jordan, but I just had to tell you, he is a bassist. It's oh, fine. Okay. I'm a drummer. We're the, oh. we're the superior one. Uh, that's right. But, but you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> bass is like it's intrinsic to a song and you can have a like when doves cry and, and not have a bass line in a song but it's extremely rare it, it provides a, a really important thing but also with very few exceptions you don't want to like have that be all there is you, you, it's it's i think a theme or a meaning or you know a, a lesson or any of those things are it can be a component of storytelling but it should all be in the furthering of just locking people into this story. And if you do that, they're gonna learn something. But like, I really don't think that should be what people think their job is, is to, if you wanna, if you think your job should be teaching people, you should be a, a teacher. Um, if you wanna be a storyteller, you should think about telling stories. That, that's how I look at it. You know, uh, that's a great answer. Uh, Brennan, forgive me if you had a follow up to that, but I just kinda, before we, I don't know where we're going next. Um, Obviously, you can't answer from writing at a different point in time, literally. But do you think nowadays, uh, because me, me and Brennan are writers, but we're not on the same, we have different circles of networks than you, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, like you write for TV, you write, um, you write some really successful books. So I'm wondering from where you're standing, since nowadays we have the greatest technology um, that he, this species has ever, ever had, do you think it's more of, how do I word this? Do you think it's more of a challenge to writers to be careful what they say, specifically to avoid certain backlash? And um, I'm not trying to use the word cancel, but I'm going to sure. say for lack of a better word, because I'm not smart enough to think of it, but for <laughs> lack of a better word, do you think that people uh, would set a lot of writers that you've seen sacrifice story for appeasement of people that might not even know or care about them? Is that something that you've noticed? Do you face that yourself? Uh, you know, look, obviously there are issues about, um, you know, storytelling now. Some of this is you know an unequal distribution of how we how we see the world um yeah. and, and we're all kind of catching up to different levels and things are being redefined and i really feel like if somebody goes out intentionally to make something that is like ooh, i'm so on pc wow um that's usually going to be some bad art if somebody is so oh, i'm trying so hard not to offend somebody that's that's going to be bad art but i think What's, what I think is really happening right now, and people aren't talking about it, is, is there is just this like um, overwhelming sense of tastefulness that is washing over everybody right now. And it's, it's not due to like people on Twitter. That's like a part of it. That's not a very big part of it. What's really going on right now is that massive corporations have vertically integrated the entertainment industry so that everything is owned in a non-competitive way 
that you know Warner Brothers owns HBO, HBO Max, um, Disney owns Marvel and all that, and and Netflix is over there, and there are just these narrowing columns where things can get in if you want to even really make a living telling stories. And so the people who control all that, they, they're not uh, prigs or prudes and they're not, um, you know, um, right-wing fascists or anything like that. What they are, they're terrified. And what they're terrified specifically is they're terrified of their own jobs being lost, not the company being hurt or any, or you as the artist being hurt. They're worried about their own jobs because these jobs are very tenuous and they, if they think people at Twitter are going to make a big noise about stuff and, and cost them money, they're not going to do something. Um, and, you know, everybody focuses on like the trans issue or something like that and totally ignores, go out and try and sell an anti U S military show right now. Oh, <laughs> you know, go out and try and, and do something about anti-imperialism in, in this world it wouldn't even make it in the door for people to get mad at on Twitter, you know? And because these people are, again, they're worried about their jobs. And, and as a function of that, they want to make money for their company. And that's really all anybody in a position of power cares about. So they will be anti-trans, or I'm sorry, they will be pro-trans rights up until the point that it would cost them money by like hurting Dave Chappelle. It would take all the politics out of it. That's all that's going on is, is, is a power... Um, equation is being done in some room of like which decision makes us more money. So like a year and a half ago, um, or a, you know a year ago, nobody wanted to sell a cop show because of George, George Floyd, and there was this this fear that that was oh we can't make a cop show now. Cop shows are back because they, they their their politics are just merely contingent on what they think is going to please their audience, and and that's kind of all there is to it. So as an artist. You know, look, if you're writing something and you are really worried that you're going to offend somebody, you just kind of have to look at it honestly and go, wait, okay, wait, am I doing something that is actually, you know, hurting somebody or am I just afraid the way that these corporate people are afraid? Am I afraid that, oh, something might hurt my career? And all I would say is like, who's been canceled? That that uh, I don't know if you guys remember American Dirt. American Dirt was this yeah, book, yeah. you know for, that for it, those that don't know though. Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, it was a book that came out. I don't know what was it two years ago, maybe a year ago. Time doesn't or mean so, anything yeah. anymore. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> only a year or two ago, but it feels like it was like eight or ten. Yeah, um, that was a a a white woman who wrote a book that was about a a Mexican woman crossing the border. I didn't read it. Um, but like people got very angry about it online and people made a big stink of it. And I guess by most definitions of the word, she was, if Dave Chappelle was canceled just now, then this woman was canceled. Um, Dave Chappelle still has hundreds of millions of dollars. This woman was a bestseller for years, you know, and her next book is coming out soon. Nothing bad happened to her. Nothing bad really ends up happening most of the time. Hmm. Um, so look, you know, does that mean I don't worry about like my new book coming out and there being issues about the, um, you know, it touches on sexual assault in, in Hollywood. And do I worry that people are going to say, you don't have the right to tell that story? Yeah, I worry about it. But you have to just get to a place of like, where did I ever think that I had the right to not offend people that like, so that person can feel offended. And they can even say something about it on Twitter. And that's kind of almost certainly the end of it. You know, the number of people who are actually being hurt by this, I think, are minimal. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, this was a very long answer to a, a question. I love I, it. I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so, again, you know, and I, again, I'm not saying nobody uh, of a lesser station has been hurt. You know, I don't, you know, there, there can be witch hunts. There absolutely can be. And I'm not, you know, um, and there are people who get, take a hit because, you um, of the moment, you know, mm. uh, oh, it, the, you just happened to have an, a subject that was the main to topic of Twitter today, right as the day your book came out or, you know, bad things happen, but hey, you know, some movies came out on 9-11, you know, like um, yeah. some, sometimes there's <laughs> bad luck. And, you know, one thing I've learned for sure in, in Hollywood where I have brushed up, two things I've learned. Um, when I've brushed up against people who are much more successful than I am, I've, I've you know, occasionally crossed paths with them is a, 
success and money don't make you happy at all. That's not just a, a thing people say. It truly does not. And in fact, the, the longer I'm out here, the more I'm convinced that the people who achieve real huge success both aren't made happy by it and aren't happy anyway, because <laughs> there's something unnatural that you have to do to really reach that absolute upper pinnacle of success. Um, and the other thing that I know for sure is it doesn't, talent exists and talent can help you, but even the most talented person in the world, if they're successful, they were also lucky. They also had a lucky break. They also just happened to come around at the right time that if Jimi Hendrix was born today and was the world's greatest guitar player, nobody would give a shit, you know, like nobody would care. Who's the greatest guitar player alive today? You know, I don't know. Nobody cares. But he happened to be the greatest guitar player in the world at the Too moment. Too many. That, well, well, exactly. <laughs> it is, is he was lucky to have come to his instrument and to the electric guitar at the moment that the world was ready for somebody like Jimi Hendrix to show up and blow everybody away. Yeah, he was a black left-handed guitarist in the 60s. Yeah. And, you, you know, know. He, hit, he hit the psychedelic m- movement at exactly the right age. You know, if he had been a 50 year old man when that happened, would he have been able to do what he did? He might have played the music, but would we, would people have listened, you know? Um, and, and so there's a lot of luck in all of this. And, and maybe your book will succeed or, or your movie or your TV show. Maybe it will fail. Maybe it was good and maybe it wasn't. You know, like you can't control a lot of it. You really can't. And, and so you kind of have to be a drunk in a car crash and just let it happen. There's two points I want to make, and then Brennan, please jump in. One, um, not you know, details don't really matter, but I've noticed from personal experience that the best thing to do, because everyone is a spoke on a wheel, where eventually it'll be your turn to get the fuck you by some random people. The best <laughs> thing to do is just laugh about it with your friends and say, "Hey, fuck that guy or girl," yep, and then keep doing your thing because it's not. I mean. Imagine you're walking down the street, right? And you see someone and they're just really making you uncomfortable. Whether you're intimidated or not, it's a different thing. What's the point in engaging with them? You're not going to get <laughs> anything but maybe a bruised knuckle or face or whatever. Right. So that's my first point. The second one is um, I just finished listening to this fascinating conversation today. Uh, Chuck Palahniuk, um, mm-hmm. second, I think is the second time. He... Only a few days ago, within this week of recording this episode, he was on the Joe Rogan show. And they talked a lot about a lot of different things. But one of them was uh, Chuck, and he laughs. I love the way he talks and things. But he was saying how he's just one person. And doesn't matter at the end of the day what he is or who he does because he's just one person. And there'll be many people after him. There'll be many people before him. I mean, that's really a simplistic way to say what he said. But it made me feel better. (laughs) Yeah, I, uh, I did this one time and, and I, I've said this, I don't remember what venue I said this before, but um, that I um, go look at a best, like a New York Times bestseller list from like 1954, you know, or, or, or 1961. And like, maybe you'll see like one name on that entire list is yeah. a name that you recognize today. But like the people who were in 1953 walking around going, I am the bestselling author. I am the man gone gone and never coming back never being up dug up never being rediscovered gone and that's the fate of like all but like three or four five writers um of any given generation otherwise you know um it's just they're gone and i mean think about i mean i heard i are you guys also the hosts of the paperback horror um podcast or is, is that somebody else in your network no uh we do one called unburying the dead uh oh uh, yeah yeah so you're referencing that yeah 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 i'm saying like those like everybody who came up around stephen king other than like maybe peter straub and like one or two others that was a huge boom and you walk into a used bookstore they still have those giant shelves of like the cracked spines and all that but they are they're going and i'm not saying that to insult them because like (laughs) um i'll be gone i'm you know, I certainly haven't sold as many books as a lot of those guys and uh, and they're gone and uh, we all go. So there is something freeing about it, don't you think? Yeah, uh, we had Peter on. Still fucking weird wow. to say that. It's r- very weird to say that. All I do is tweet at him like you, which, by the way, if you're listening to this and you want to have a podcast, I don't say this and I should because 
I love podcasts before I started this, but um, just tweet to someone. Don't be a dick, but like I asked you, Jordan, you were really <laughs> cool about it. And um, Peter is grossly underappreciated. Like we, I wasn't expecting everyone to be like, holy shit, you had him on. But like, it was weird to be in circles of the horror genre in particular. And maybe a handful of people are like, oh, that's cool. Like, I love his mm-hmm. books. And uh, we just did one last night about Robert Morasco's Burnt Offerings, which is the bridge between um, the Victorian era of ghost stories to literally The Shining and, hmm. and Amityville Horror and all those. Um, then you got guys like Robert Block. Um, if you want to talk about crime, we got me and Brennan just picked these, uh, this one up. Uh, oh, yeah. Me and him met in person finally because we're from the same home state uh, a couple um, weeks ago. And for audio listeners, this is, oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you, this is a video episode too, uh, show too. Uh, I was holding up Raymond Chandler's A Big Sleep. And that was recommended to me by Joe Lansdale, um, who, if you don't know who that is, you should check him out too. But that's yeah. another name, Lansdale. I think that he could walk around most places and like you put him around riders, they'll they'll all go crazy for him. But like he's got the life. He knows all these big Hollywood celebrities like Bruce Campbell. He he can write in literally the Batman animated series. Mm-hmm. I love that shit as a kid. I got a Batman comic book or it's a book by Lansdale. I mean, like he writes everything. Bubba Hotep's one of my favorite movies. I didn't know Joe Lansdale wrote that. That was based off his short story called oh, Bubba Hotep. Huh. I, I must have known that at, at some point from at least reading it on the movie screen. But like, that's awesome. He's friends with. He, it, it's strange. Like, he should be more well known, and not knocking you, but like, I'm surprised you don't have like fifty thousand or more followers. You have some pretty <laughs> success. Like, she rides shotgun. That's we'll dive more into that in a moment. Um, but how that book didn't become the next, you know, I was gonna say Denzel Washington, but that one makes sense for him to be Nate. How that didn't become the next training day, though, because oh, it's 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 got that grit to, to it. Um, Thank you. Yeah, it beats me, Brennan. I'm talking a lot. Why don't you jump in, buddy? Yeah, it really would not make sense for Nate to be played by Denzel Washington. Um, I just love Denzel Washington wow. so much. No, I do too. I mean, hey, look, let's be clear. If Denzel Washington wants to, to play Nate, we, we will make wait that. A, yeah, wait a minute. El- okay. El- How old is Denzel now? I don't know. Like, he can what's do it, it anyway. <laughs> I don't care. Uh, Idris, uh, uh, Idris Elba? Name? Yeah, he played the gunslinger. So why can't he? Yeah. Why can't Nate be black? <laughs> no, absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely. I would be totally... Uh, open to that. Um, you know, um, I mean, thank you for the kind words on She Rides Shotgun. I think that, um, you know, it won the Edgar Award, and I'm very, I'm very happy about it. And and I feel like its reputation is is growing. I think it is going to be um, a grower, not a shower, um, of a book. And um, and I, I appreciate that. Um, to be a cult classic um, is is a very cool thing to be. Uh, I can't, I, I don't, haven't really said this out loud yet, um, but, um, and I, I can't say everything about it. I am, I have written the script for a She Ride Shotgun movie. Oh, um, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I really hope it happens. There is a director that, uh, again, I can't say, but like, I, I have, I have high hopes and um, hopefully that will do a lot for it. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I certainly don't want to come off like poor little me. Uh, but this is what happened to me the day that my book came out. And I think it's, it's an instructive lesson for anybody, I think. Uh, again, who am I to instruct? But like, I went up to the, the Barnes and Noble near me the day that She Rides Shotgun came out. Um, and I was like, this is going to be so cool to see my book at the bookstore, you know, and I'll walk in. And instead of like having that feeling that I thought I was going to have of like, here it is, I just couldn't help. I looked around at Barnes and Noble. And I was like, there's a million books in here. There's like a million books in here. Who's going to find mine? How's anybody going to find mine? Um, and, and, you know, I think, look, I love it. I, and I, I'm not complaining. And, and the book is, is successful. I, I don't want to uh, appear like that it's not. But like, um, 
a lot of books get written every year, you know, and, and it, it's overwhelming. And, and we all have those books that we, we wish we had time to read. And, and, and I'm just now, this is my new one right now. I'm reading the, uh, the quiet American by Graham green. Um, uh, it's a great book, but, uh, it's one of the big gaps in my, in my reading. He's like, um, you know, one of those people who like John le Carre, who, who live in that space between genre and literary writing these kind of spy novels that are also like, you know, really great deep looks into like humankind. And this one is really interesting because it, it's set and was written um, in, Vietnam, in Vietnam when it was still controlled by the French in the early 60s. And he Ooh. is clearly, he is like, it's about a British reporter and, and an American guy who's probably a CIA agent. Um, and they're kind of watching um, the French lose Vietnam before the Americans really started coming in heavy. And it's so interesting because you can see the whole boondoggle that was about to happen unfolding. It's a really interesting book. Um, sort of a, uh, sort of a tangent there, I suppose, but um, that's, that's, that's the new book that I'm reading right now is, is the quiet Americans. Anyway, oh, sorry, the, I, I forgot how we got there, but. Uh. No, no, we, we like tangents. Uh, I just got to ask. So like Vietnam war started right after Korea. Um, is that so? It's talking about the Vietnam War. You said the sixties. Is it so? It's in the point of view of a with the French during the Vietnam War. Yeah, well, it's he's a, he's a British reporter who is embedded. Um, he's in um, Saigon, um, and it's like let me see. I'm just looking to see when it was actually published. Um, oh, well, actually, it was published in 1955. So he's really. It's Ooh. it's while well, the French still really have control of it. So my my bad to jump ahead a decade the way I just did. But that's um, the first year. Yeah, uh, the first year that like Americans were there. Or? No, that's the first year of the Vietnam War. Oh, okay. Um, because he references at one point that like um most of the world attention is still on Korea. So he must have um. There you go. My deep world history there. Um. <laughs> But uh, no, it's really fascinating. I, I got to him finally because I'd just gone through reading John le Carre, who is um, also fantastic. Um, who writes these like novels about, you know, spies and things that I always thought were, because I had never picked them up, I thought they were like um, a lot worse written than they are. He's actually, he's a fantastic writer. Um, they're a little slow, but I think everything written back then feels slow to us today because um, Twitter has eaten a hole in my brain. Yeah, yeah, that's fair to say. Um, Brennan, <laughs> go ahead, because I, I want to jump in, but I don't want to catch you. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll agree with that. I've, I, I haven't read a ton of Lakari, but um, I read the, uh, I, I don't know what the name of the trilogy would be, but the one that starts with uh, Tinker Tail or Soldier Spy. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's, I hate to throw the word slow burn on it, but it does. It, it's, it walks you through, but it's, it really sucks you in. It's very, very intriguing. Um. That aside, though, uh, let's let's talk a little more about She Rides Shotgun. Um, so for potential new readers, can you give us a little uh, synopsis? Yes, and I'll give the synopsis the way I would give it, but then I'll ask you a question about that. So uh, She Rides Shotgun is a story of, of Polly, who is an 11-year-old girl um, who is kidnapped from in front of her elementary school by her father, who she quickly realizes is he, she wonders, he's so fresh out of jail that she thinks he must have broken out. Um, and, and he takes her away from her life. She's been living with her mother and her stepfather. And, and her father, Nate, is this, um, you know, kind of muscle-bound, angry, tattooed ex-con. Um, and Polly is a, a, a girl who's very quiet, even though she's 11 years old. She has a teddy bear that she carries everywhere. And she uses as sort of a way to mediate her relationship with the world because she can't really handle the world on its own. Um, and what you learn, I guess this is slight spoilers, but it's pretty early on in the book. You, you learn that her mother is dead. Her stepfather is dead, all because of something Nate did in prison to anger um, Aryan Steel, which is my stand in for the Aryan Brotherhood. Um, and in order to stay alive and get the green light lifted on the both of them, Nate has to teach his daughter how to fight and steal. And you watch this girl come out of her shell. Um, and they go to war against the Aryan Brotherhood, uh, more or less. And, and, and that's the synopsis. Uh, what I would ask you guys is, if you were describing it, would you start with Polly or would you start with Nate? I was surprised to start with Polly. I would start with Nate. So that was interesting. See, now 
I, I would have said, well, okay. So having read the book, I would absolutely start with Polly. She's the main character. That's what I find really interesting is I think of Polly as the main character, but I find a lot of uh, people uh, think Nate is. And, and that, by the way, that's not like wrong. I'm not saying like, oh, <laughs> that's wrong. It's just, uh, and, and it's interesting because um, my very first draft of She Rides Shotgun that I wrote was, was um, bad. And it was entirely from Nate's point of view. And it didn't work. Like the novel did not work when it was all from his point of view. And all I did was, I mean, first of all, I read the book and I read about 50 pages of my rough draft before I realized what the mistake had been was and, and how to fix it was going to be, oh, I'm going to have to rewrite nearly every word in the novel, even if I don't change the story at all. <laughs> um, and I literally, this was, I was staffed on the TV show Gotham at the time. And I had sat down on the floor of my office and for about three months, that pile of paper did not move from the floor of my office because I stopped 50 pages and I was so dejected by the fact that I was going to have to rewrite the whole thing that, um, that I, I couldn't touch it for about three months. And then I picked it back up and I tried rewriting it um, from Polly's point of view, which was the correct, it, it's, it's why the novel works as much as I think it works. Um, and I think there was uh, some part of me that thought, I couldn't, you talk about things you're scared to do or things that people are going to say you get wrong. I was like, well, I can't tell this. What do I know about being an 11 year old girl? You know, I can't tell that. Um, to be honest, now that I've gone through the process, I have way more in common with an 11 year old girl than I do with Nate McCluskey. <laughs> um, to the point of, and by the way, I did not uh, plan this. And if this makes me seem like a really weird guy, I apologize. But um, I, this is the bear <laughs> that She Ride Shotgun was based off of, which um, I still keep around. Um, I got mine too. Yeah, why, why would you ever get rid of it? Like, I just, it's a magical thing, in my opinion. Like, uh, something that you've had that long is just like, um, uh, I don't necessarily believe in magic, but, I, you know, that's a. When did you get that teddy bear and what's its name? Uh, its name is Pookie. And I got it when I was probably four years old. So he is decades and decades old. Here's the thing. Sometimes you can talk, and again, I'll bring up Chuck. He'll talk about how he talks about an embarrassing thing, really fucked up situation, but all of us can relate to it. Just like porn. Most, pretty much all of us watching masturbate. You know what? It's all that shit's considered weird in public conversation or not dinner talk. But guess what? Jumping to the other side of the coin, adults with toys like action figures or, or teddy bear. I got my two. I got a few of them. One for my Nana, my dad's mom. Because she passed away and she meant the world mm. to me. Um, and my two teddy bears, uh, Rainbow and Sunshine. Yeah. I'm sure that growing up, I'd get shit for that. and might get my butt beat by a few of the guys growing up. I don't really give a shit anymore. <laughs> I mean, is there anything sadder than the idea of some guy like taking his childhood teddy bear that he desperately wants to keep and throwing it away because he's afraid like somebody's going to like, I don't know what, laugh at him at some point? Like, I don't see how that's tough, you know, like, I don't see how like, that's like the, the masculine response is like, well, I certainly don't want to be laughed at. Um, Grow, growing up and in the eighth grade, I reached a conclusion that I don't give a fuck with strangers or people I don't want to be friends with or people like not kissing your ass again, but I guess <laughs> sake, cause I feel like him with you, Jordan or guys like Lansdale or uh, even Sean Cosby, like, I want to be friends with all you guys. I think you're cool motherfuckers. I like guys that write Thank good you. books and can tell good stories i'm i'm real i'm a simpleton i guess but what? um my whole point was is that goes back to what i was talking about with how people respond to your writing because i've written a lot of books none's none are published but um my ad to going in is i hope some people hate it i hope it's <laughs> polarizing as hell i hope i don't get death threats but i hope some people really feel such a strong reaction from it that they're maybe a little offended for weird reasons because people are offended with everything because good art pulls strong emotions for the simple fact that you did your job as a storyteller. I, uh, I, I don't look at my one-star reviews. I don't. I, <laughs> Smart I know guy. some people do. Smart I know some, some people do, and I, just, I don't need that in my head, you know, but I did see one the other day on Amazon. It was not a one-star review. I'm actually very proud of the fact that it was still a three-star review, but it was... Um, 
a three-star review of like, I really love this book, but the violence was so horrific. I wish somebody had warned me. Um, and I was like, wow. So you thought it was horrific and you still gave it three stars. All right. That's like, I can, <laughs> and I guess, you know, I came up in, in an era where I just expect violence to be really visceral and shocking. And um, I do, I guess, right. Very explicit violence, but like, I don't know, maybe it's just too much Cormac McCarthy and, and James Elroy, but like, I would say not a, the one star reviews I have seen. I mean, obviously some people just think I suck because somebody's got, always going to think you suck. Yeah. Um, but the, uh, there is a lot of, about the, the violence, but have you, have you ever done that? This is an interesting thing to do. I think is go to your like very favorite book or, or movie and, and go to Amazon and read the one star reviews for like a piece of art that you love. And like, you know, a lot of them are just, you're just going to make you angry. You go like, shut up. You're, 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 you know, you're stupid. You didn't get it, whatever. But there's going to be like one, one star review of something you love that you can look at and go, okay. Like if that's how you approach art, then yes, I could see that this would be a one star thing. Like, and I think it's really healthy to understand that like people can absolutely loathe your favorite things correctly, just because we, we want different stuff out of life. We want different stuff out of art, you know? Yeah. I'm totally hearing you out and yeah, I just pulled up one of my favorite stories of all time is I am legend by Richard Matheson. Great, great story. All right. So the first, so yeah, right. It's fucking amazing. It's like, push it, watch out Dracula. This is the best vampire movie ever written. Just mm. this, this one random asshole's opinion, but I'm looking at some of these one stars in the title boring. Are, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> right. That's right. Like a lot of them are just going to be like, okay, fuck you. <laughs> um I, i've only got a few short pieces published but i don't even look at it's for it, they're all anthologies but i don't even look at those man because uh, same reason you don't look at the one star reviews i, I don't want to get in the habit of looking at those because i'm already compulsive enough which i could relate to earlier the compulsiveness for that drives you with certain things and and that would I'm already trying to back off of social media as it is. <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's a poison. There's no doubt that it's a poison. And um, I, uh, you know, I'm back on Twitter right now, but I can see there's a, a direct correlation to the amount I write, a, a direct inverse correlation, I should say, about the amount that I write and the amount that I'm on Twitter. It is, um, it kills my drive to create. Uh, and I think it's literally just uh, Twitter's just full of cops. That's all Twitter is full of. And, and, and it could be a cop about, oh, don't say this or don't think that, or it could be a cop, of, don't put pineapple on pizza, you know, but like everybody on fucking Twitter is a fucking cop, including me. Like I will go on there and be like, oh, look at this asshole. Um, and, and it's such an unhealthy mindset to be in to create. I really think like, I just think it's so bad for you and i it's also really addictive which is why I, I keep coming back to it but it took me a while to realize this but it's not real life meaning that people think in in general they think with um uh binary logic um mm -hmm. it's either right or wrong black or white and it's always so extreme for the most part so i'm just using it to kind of like just talk to people now because i noticed i don't know about you too but i started noticing that i'm posting things to see if i can get a reaction not like a negative one or make people upset just to like have some interaction because this slot of time in my life has no interaction with people on a digital platform i'm like that's so fucking sad and weird <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like the 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 whatever 20 something year old version of me that just got into my space when that came out would be like all right dude like stay off computers for a little bit and get back to watching movies that that's 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 fun that's where life's at <laughs> <laughs> i agree I mean, there, and there are good things about it i and i have made actual friends from being online like you know there are uh, um you know i have a lot of friends from the crime fiction community that i i have met in real life like sean cosby um you know um a lot of people like that but there are also people who i have never met in real life who i am now pretty good friends with or, or people i started hanging out with in real life um film twitter has been very good about that for me um you know i, I fell into a good circle of people who are all, all kind of watch a lot of crime films and and you know we all kind of met through 
uh, One Heat Minute, which is the podcast where they, uh, Blake Howard, uh, the great Blake Howard, uh, came up with this idea of watching one minute of heat and recording an entire podcast episode about it and then watching the next <laughs> minute of heat. And so he did uh, whatever it was, 250 whatever episodes. Wow. Um, and I did, I did like three of them. And then, you know, my friend Jed Ayers did a couple and then we fell in with like Travis Woods who uh, did a couple and now we all hang out and uh, or at least virtually and Travis is my movie going buddy here in LA. Um, so like, you know, it, it, there are good things about it, but like, man there's a lot of bad about it too brandon guy thoughts on this on this you know it's it's funny because i i I feel like um i I feel like jordan's kind of taken us out of our groove in that usually i feel like when we when when we're trying to talk about somebody's book and we get off on a tangent we have to apologize and say oh let's you know talk about your book try and sell some copies and this i I, I, I have questions about the book. I want to go back oh, to it. Please, but I also, please. No, but no, here's the thing. I, I, I'd almost rather just listen to you talk for the next hour. Oh, thank um, you. It's, <laughs> it's, it, it, I feel like every time, you know, you apologize for going on a tangent, I'm like, oh, that's good. Oh, I want to come back to that. And ooh, that's interesting too. Um, so yeah. I, I am going to drag us back to, to She Rides Shotgun, but, sure. but I almost feel obligated to apologize for no. it. Um, <laughs> Please and by the way, so, everybody buy She Ride Shotgun. Let's let's please let's do. plug let's plug the book. Like, go ahead. It's one of the greatest books I've ever read, man. Oh. For real, seriously. Wow. Thank you. It's so and and it's so good. and harking back to you know the whole rewrite and and kind of making Polly the main character. I, I, I totally get why that worked. She's the heart. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm extremely curious. You know, you said you, you gave us the bare tidbit of I have more in common with an 11 year old girl than with an ex con. Uh, but I, I want to know how you kind of went about putting yourself in that headspace. Oh, well, yeah, no, that's that's the trick of it. Right. Is, is you just you have to find the things that unlock the character, which is almost certainly going to be something about um, yourself, you know, and. I, again, I don't think I've ever said this out loud about the book, but I'll, I'll, I'll say it now is uh, it is a, it's a novel about anxiety. That is what She Rides Shotgun is about, is about oh, a, a novel about anxiety and, and your relationship to the world um, and, and how you deal with, with these feelings. And, and what the argument that I make that I, uh, I think that the book makes is that um, violence is sometimes good and, and that particularly we have violence inside us. And this is actually, this is a line from a, a TV script that I sold that didn't get turned into a TV show uh, with another character, but still I think it applies as uh, something you, you learn about anxiety at some point in your life is that you're not actually, when you get like anxious in social situations, you're not scared of the other person, you're scared of yourself and you're scared of what you're capable of, what you could do. It's that same fight or flight instinct that gets locked up in your head. And, you know, fight or flight was really valuable when we were cavemen and the things we had to worry about were woolly mammoths and, you know, uh, other people coming to hit us with clubs because then you got that burst of adrenaline and you could either fight back or you could run fight or flight. And, uh, you know, with a character like Polly, but also with, I think, most people today, that system gets totally jammed up because the things you're scared of aren't things that you can run from and they're not things that you can kill. Um, most of the things that we're worried about today, like you can't run from climate change. You can't kill climate change. Um, <laughs> unless and, you're Al Gore. <laughs> unless you're Al Gore and, and he didn't finish the job. So, um, so you know, a lot of what I write is, is about that, that, you know, that, that there's violence inside us that sometimes it's better out in the world, particularly if you aim it correctly, which I do think is a totally, you know, valid thing to do. Um, and, and so, you know, finding that outsider feeling for Polly, that anxiousness, that thing that is locking her up. Um, and then actually, the, although this didn't come until a later draft, it was what really unlocked the character for me of Polly is the metaphor that she presents for herself, that she is somebody from Venus, that she is you know, there's this planet that looks calm and, and easy on the outside. It looks like just a little pearl, but it, those are actually acid clouds. And the actual surface of Venus is this horrific place where acid wind, you know, rakes across rocks. And her reading that and saying, that's who I am. Um, that to me was what unlocked 
the character because I think that's a pretty good metaphor for a lot of anxious people, particularly people who come off as like quiet or reserved. But again, it's because they're holding these giant storms inside themselves. And so I think that was uh, a big part of, um, you know, uh, getting Polly to work and, and for me to go, oh, this is what, you know, the difference between her and Nate is Nate is somebody who also is carrying around these huge feelings and the, these huge, um, you know, reservoirs of, of violence and, and, and adrenaline inside himself, but he has rightly and wrongly been taught to put it out into the world. And, you know, the, the character of Nick, his older brother, by the way, they are named after the Diaz brothers, the UFC fighters, uh, Nick and Nate Diaz. Oh. Um, um, I used to be very, when, especially during the writing of this book, I was like taking Brazilian jiu-jitsu and I was very into the UFC. Mm. Um, and uh, in an early adopter of the Joe Rogan, you know, podcast and, and whatnot. So, um, you know, he was a person who had been taught to put the violence out into the world. You know, the, the British uh, edition of She Rides Shotgun is called A Lesson in Violence um, because they didn't know what She Rides Shotgun meant. So they didn't want to call it that. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, you know, so that I, I guess that's my answer is, is to say like, I, I, you lock in on those, every character is always, you know, a little bit of you that you, you know, you kind of make, oh, these three out of the 12 feelings I have, I will put into this character um, and, and really figuring those out for Polly and figuring out, because she's the one who really goes on a journey. She's the one who changes. And so she is the one whose perspective you, you need to be with um, because Nate, yeah, he learns to love. He learns to become gentle and soft and, and he learns to have, you know, that thing that he says of to have something to live for is to have something to die for. Um, and that's important, but that's not the massive journey that Polly undergoes under the course of the novel. So she is the person whose perspective matters the most, I think. And I do think there's a, a, a realism in crime fiction to, you know, the, the old adage that you, you say to children, you know, violence never solved anything. It's just straight up not true. It is. Uh, and uh, it's, you know, when you when you tell a kid um, that violence never solved anything, what you're really saying is the answer I need to give you is more complex than I can than I can yes. fit into the next minute of my life. Um, and th they're just you know, it, it granted, it's not always the optimum. Sometimes, sometimes sure. flight is okay. But at the same time, if it, if it flies in your face, you know, and you don't have a choice, then, you know, standing up to the uh, uh, Aryan steel and saying, you know, my mom said that uh, I, I'm, I'm not supposed to hit any, but you know, it, it's not <laughs> going to work. It, it's not realistic. And uh, it's going to lend your writing or your storytelling uh it, it and just this this air of it, it's fake it's yeah. um so and i and i appreciated that about it because you know i i don't i don't know if this gets too spoilery feel free to tell us and we'll we'll cut it but uh polly has to embrace violence at some yeah. degree this is an 11 year old girl who you know a week before the events of this book isn't thinking that isn't isn't dreaming of that um but without that embrace the story doesn't work they oh you know yeah no i i agree and and i i absolutely wanted to get her to that place and and to say that there are times that you have to 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 fight and i agree with you it, it's in the real world it's a very complicated question um you guys ever see uh, you know who william t volman is the novelist william t volman mm -hmm. he uh he wrote this book called Rising Up and Rising Down, um, which I'm going to both say is very fascinating, and, but it's also important to note, I have never finished it because it's an incredibly <laughs> uh, difficult book. Um, but it's his like kind of, uh, it's like textbook length. There's an actual, there's a 10 volume version of it, but you can also buy like the 700 page version of it, which is all I have, um, where he tries to ex explicate when it is and isn't right to use violence. And he like really works it out with all these different examples. And he, he was in Kosovo and like saw violence firsthand. He was in a car where two of his friends were killed by snipers and he had to like wait until the sun set and crawl out. So he's like been, you know, in, in to these places. And, and, but he says, no, there are times that like the defense of your homeland is a viable reason to like kill people. Like if people are coming to destroy your home, you have the right to fight back. And like, but he just keeps going through all these different 
um, scenarios and tries to kind of almost work out like an equation of saying this is when it's okay and this is when it's not. But again, the books, the the and the small version of it is um, seven hundred pages or something crazy like that. Um, Sean Cosby had a question. He said, "Did oh. did you always know how she rides shotgun was going to end?" Um. Hi, Sean. Um, hello, Sean. Um, yeah, you know, um, again, like to, to keep the spoiler mode sort of intact, um, I, I don't write books in order most of the time. Uh, my most recent one, I actually did write in order. It was the first one I ever had. Um, so sort of the, the climax of Polly's story um, and the bear story uh, was maybe the first chapter I wrote um, uh, to completion. Um, you know, the very end of the novel, I think, came about later when I kind of had to look at the, the mess that I had made and go, okay, well, what happens after this? And, and, and then you just try and be honest about it. Um, but um, yeah, the ending wasn't I, I the ending wasn't the hard part. It was the it was the journey to getting there and particularly, you know, the uh, the mode of storytelling. But um, yeah, is Polly developmentally delayed? That's interesting. I don't think she's developmentally delayed. I saw somebody in a review one time refer to her as neuroatypical, um, which I guess is true, although I, I tend to think that means that she's on the autism spectrum, which I don't think is correct again i wrote her as um having a lot of the same childhood traits that i had like um you know um she's tested as as gifted which i i think it's questionable if that means anything at all but like it's a it's a thing that it it's a weird thing to tell a kid you know um and um and again i i think she's anxious i don't think she's developmentally disabled I, I i certainly wasn't thinking anything that um you know clinical when i wrote her i just tried to to write this person with these like giant huge feelings inside her that she didn't know how to deal with um yeah i stole that question from brennan i don't know if he's gonna ask that but we were talking about it and he i didn't know i didn't know if she was didn't you say she isn't she uh what like uh he said 11 yeah, she's 11. She's certainly emotionally disabled, I think, if that is a term. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I, again, and, and not that I was exactly like that when I was, I was 11 years old, but I was certainly weird. And um, <laughs> I really just tried to, to capture as much of those feelings that I could remember from being a kid, you know? Fair enough. Brennan, any more questions about the book, sir? No, and, I, and and I'll clarify a little bit. Um, when when Patrick and I were talking about the book, um, I am uh, on my, in my day job. I'm a, a music teacher, and hmm. I uh, got my graduate degree in specifically teaching uh, music to um, disabled students, but primarily uh, students who are autistic. Hmm. And you know, I had mentioned to him that there were a lot of um, there are a lot of qualities in Polly's character that, you know, it's just reminded me of students that I've worked with. Um, so I, I was kind of curious about that. So I well, have my answer. <laughs> like, well, but again, like, you know, in the, in the true death of the author argument, which I totally believe in is, is like, I, I wrote the book, but that doesn't mean I get to answer that question necessarily. Like if, if more than one person is picking up on this then I might have unintentionally written a you know uh, somebody who's on the autism spectrum i i don't know if i did or not but like i i don't think i get a pick if i did or not either do you know mm -hmm. what i mean like if that's what i did um and uh i again i i, I don't think unless i just discovered i'm on the autism spectrum um uh i don't you know <laughs> but, whoa but, sorry I, I swear this is not gonna turn into my therapy session but um uh, no that's interesting though um and and like i said you're not the only person to have said it so it's it's interesting yeah. to think about well, and I think by, you know, the definition of a spectrum, it's got such a broad range of traits that, True. you know, you, you could, you could almost take any character and say, you know, I see this, I see that. But like I said, I, you know, I saw some things in Polly that I've seen in students who are diagnosed with that specific um, uh, disorder. So, Interesting. Um, 
again, I was interested in it. So yeah, that's the beauty of books. I mean, you can you can flat out say this is allegorical for this and that, but doesn't mean that the next reader is going to say I agree with that, <laughs> even with the even with the creator. That's the best part about books, man. I think not to jump all the way back to the beginning of our our conversation, but like Do the, it. the the, the <laughs> that thing that you were talking about about people getting very angry about what people write and and being offended by it, it, it gives such power to the author to suggest that everything they wrote was totally intended and totally the product of their conscious mind. And, and that, and that you are also interpreting it completely the way they meant you, you to, so that, so that your offense is like founded in something as opposed to like, maybe it's something that you are carrying in yourself that it, again, like you're reading this text, you can put whatever you want in, or you can take whatever you want out of it. And, and to, to get really, really upset about what somebody has written um, I mean, unless it's just like an obvious, like, you know, um, the protocols of the elders of Zion or something like that is just a completely, you know, like a racist tirade or something. But if somebody is like close reading your book or finding one example of something you did and, and, and then projecting this entire worldview onto you, it's giving way too much power to the author. You know what I mean? It's always cynical, too. They're yes. always like, he's an evil piece of shit. He's just as bad as Himmler. Fuck Himmler, you know? <laughs> which, which by my argument with those two douchebags is that Himmler's the far more evil one of the two. Hitler is just a little pussy with a <laughs> fucked up mustache. Well, <laughs> I mean, you know. Counterbalance but... the, the whatever argument we were going for. <laughs> right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Himmler and, and, and Heydrich. If you, want to, if you want to really pick a really evil, really evil guy, um, Reinhard Heydrich is probably your your best bet was that the the jackass that got himself stranded in scotland from running out of gas in an airplane i think i don't think it was scotland i think he he his plane went down i think on the eastern front um but he okay. was the guy who um who ran the the holocaust more or less he, he was the planner of it and he was also um the highest ranking nazi to ever be assassinated um in operation anthropoid uh which is uh, there's a pretty good movie called anthropoid but there's an amazing book called hhhh it's a french novel about the assassination of reinhardt heydrich uh that is a really really good book and it, it's also a book about historical novels it's sort of metafiction which is not usually my favorite thing but um it really works in this case but it also um you know let's talk about the nazis for a second sure. um Another thing that's like this, like received wisdom right now that everybody in writing will always tell you is like, you got to make sure your villains are sympathetic, sympathetic. You got to make sure that your villains have this really strong point of view and that like, there's a version where they're the hero of the story. And I think that can be a dangerous idea a lot of times, not always. And I don't want to overstate it with like word like dangerous, but I think um, some people are, or it, they might not be a hundred percent monsters, but they deserve to be known for their monstrousness yeah. and, and that their monstrousness is the most important thing about them. Um, and, and so like, you know, um, I, I don't always think you have to, to make your, your, your villains, you know, sympathetic and, and interesting people. I think sometimes it's okay for them to just be awful. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I think that's really the case a lot of the time. I think there's a lot of sociopaths in the world. And I think they cause a tremendous amount of the, the problems that we have. And I think it's okay to portray people as such as just, uh, no, you don't have to feel bad for them. I really like the TV show Succession. Um, I really enjoy it. But every once in a while, they try and make you feel sad for these people. And I just go, no, I don't feel anything. I, I, I refuse. <laughs> Rob Zombie made one of my favorite movie horror movies, Devil's Rejects, and love that movie. I mean, those three are fucked up. They are pure yeah. evil. There's no redeeming quality of them. And they're and you also you don't have to you don't have to you kind of root for them to get away, but you know they won't. Yeah. You just root for them to get away because you want the movie to keep going. Yeah, that's all. I want to see them keep killing. Yeah, because no, I know it's fake. I know it's fake. You know it's fake. You know what? And we've talked about this once before, but I think it's real interesting that movies have a rating system, video games have a rating system, and I, I find all I, I'm a big nerd with history, and like I know that the rating system of video games was back in the day. I think Mortal Kombat was the game that kind of hit the nail in the coffin with like mm -hmm. parents were like, "Oh, that's it," and um, they were kind of pushing with like that's violence, but books don't have that. 
No. Folks don't have a rating system. And I'm not trying to go on a tirade. I know this is a hot button subject. I'm not put I'm I'm okay with either or, but as a purely observe it, observer point of view, I find the argument of trigger warnings, because that's a hot button to, to, uh, topic right now. It won't be later on. It is right now, but um, I find that interesting, especially from the point of view of uh, other creators. And specifically why I find that interesting is because there's some people that are so for one thing that they seem to be narrow minded with everything else, meaning, um, no, this is going to trigger you to do this or uh, um, no, it has to be this way but like you're not being mindful of other people and I'm not trying to make this leap, but I guess one could make an argument that, well, if we keep going down that path, won't that lead to a rating system of some sort? Won't that lead to some kind of censorship? What are your thoughts on that? I mean, you know, again, I, I don't see a, a lot of this argument seems to happen around YA novels um really and i have yeah a lot of, a lot of the argument about trigger warnings and censorship seem to happen around ya and i don't know why that is um and i don't have any theory for why that is um you know i just i think the economics of it are are so vast that you know if you're going to suddenly say well now every book that amazon sells needs a a, a rating i mean how are you even going to begin to do that are you going to have to backdate everything are you going to have to go back and 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 you know um i just i feel like for the time being books are left alone in a way that at a lot of these other art forms aren't um both in the fact that you can still basically write a book about anything you want um and somebody will publish it a main uh, you know one of the big five or big four big three probably by the time this podcast <laughs> airs um <laughs> might not publish it but hey that's you know again that's that's the way it's always been but um you know you can still go out there you can still buy a peter sotos book if that's what you're into you know you can get um you know the number of things that you can't get are almost zero you know what i mean you and i don't think that's going to change i think again the battle that i was talking about earlier for tastefulness is all happening at the level where there's a tremendous amount of money to be extracted from the, the system. And except for a very narrow band of books, that doesn't include books. Books don't make the kind of money that an Avengers movie does or a TV show does. And, and so, you know, the labor intensiveness of having to like actually put a warning label on every book that, you know, comes out, it, it would be, you know, insane. Um, and so, you know, I don't, I don't worry, again, I don't worry about it too much because I think we call it cancel culture, we call it censorship when it comes from like this very narrow band, but there are a lot of ideas that are just as poisonous to the, you know, to getting your, your, your story out there that we just all accept as, as, you know, uh, and again, I just, my, my go-to example for this, I, I mentioned earlier is like criticizing U.S. imperialism, you know, uh, suggesting that maybe our way of life is unsustainable in a truly profound way. And that, that, you know, um, that we're not the good guys, which is my basic core belief, not to, I really not trying to drag it into that realm, but like, I, you know, and a lot of it is stuff like you go, well, there are things you can't say anymore. And how much does that really hurt you that like, you know, you, you watch a movie from the nineties or you listen to a rap album from the nineties and the way gay people were talked about is very different than, than we're going to talk about gay people today. And a, it's gotta be better for gay people. And B, I don't know what I'm missing. I don't know if I'm yeah. really like, Oh man, there's like the one insult that I would always call my friends in the nineties when I was like a, a, a dumb kid that I don't use anymore. And I, my life is just as rich and full as it was yeah, right. <laughs> without that word. And, and, and they feel better. So like, you know, a lot of this stuff, again, like to me, I look at it from the perspective of somebody who is way too close to the heart of like this, like corporate monolith where I don't really know that I belong. And there are lots of things you can't say, you know, 
violence in general is on its way out as far as mainstream products go. And, and again, that doesn't really have to do with books. I'm talking more TV and movies. I'm having a really hard time selling things and maybe I just suck, but like um, there's a real feeling that like dark television is kind of on its way out. Um, Squid Games obviously being this big exception, um, but I'm afraid that the lesson that they're gonna, again, cause these are all these decisions are made by terrified executives. And I'm afraid from my own selfish point of view that the lesson that Squid Game is going to teach them is, oh, if we're gonna do something that's like crazy and anti-capitalist and violent, well, let's let the Koreans do that. Yeah, like we'll make, and, and we'll let's, make great films though. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, no, and I, I again, great for the Koreans and great for the viewer. Yeah. I'm just talking purely from the selfish point of American guy who wants to sell violent stuff. I totally is, get it. Is that I, I'm afraid that they're going to become very risk adverse and and you know, I I have done meetings with executives at streaming services where they're talking to me, me who you have read, and they're like, well, we're really in that like blue sky Ted Lasso space. Well, then why did, why did you, why am I here? <laughs> like nothing against that show, um, but like, it's not what I do. And, 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 you know, um, but again, like, and I could call that censorship. I could say like, they're censoring me, but, but it's not, that's not how it works. It's, it's again, it, it, none of these decisions are ideologically based other than like an adherence to the ideology of profit, you know, and if they thought that the the noise that they would get was worth it, they would they would make the most violent things you would ever imagine. And and you know that's uh, and to be clear, I haven't even watched the Dave Chappelle special, so I have I I can't speak on it. But like again, you don't have to have seen it to know that this is from from the president of Netflix point of view. This is only a money question. That's all it is. It's a money question. Right. And if if the money dial says more transphobia then they're pulling it that way if it says less transphobia they're pulling it that way and that's true for everything under the face of the sun they will put it on if if it keeps their job safe and it makes them money they will take it off if it doesn't and that's sort of like that and that is such a huge power compared to like people on twitter or you know anything like that that i can't really think about those people on twitter because they don't the only reason people on Twitter have any power at all is because the the everybody who makes TV and movies are on Twitter too. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And so if you can scare them, you can kind of shape the, the discourse a little, but not as much as the discourse is just shaped by these people being extremely wealthy and all hanging out with each other all of the time, you know? It's so weird that like the one social media platform where it specifically caps you off at what 140 characters, not even letters, just characters. Yeah. Including the space. Um, that that seems to be like the go-to where people try to have all these soapbox yeah. lectures and also uh, lack of a better word, intellectual conversations or to try to one up each other. It's fucking dumb. It just shows how <laughs> stupid we are as a species, man. Well, it's just, it's the one place where you can't do that. So it's the one place <laughs> everybody goes to do it. Right? Don't walk on this lawn. Well, fuck you. I'm going to pee on it. <laughs> <laughs> Brennan, what uh, are your thoughts on any of that? I, you know, I, I think Jordan said it an hour ago and we're still there, is that the uh, head honchos here are flying this banner that says they're making decisions in the name of ethics, but they're making decisions in the name of profit. Um, and that it, it shouldn't surprise anybody, you know, if, it, if they're going to cancel a special because it, you know, has a slur in it or because it defames a minority group, the ethical thing to do is to cancel that because it's further marginalizing an already marginalized community, but they're, they, if they're, if they're putting that down, if the, if the people in charge are putting that down, it's because they feel like they stand to lose money on that, not because it's the right thing. And it's, it's grotesque, but it's, it's the truth and it's not even that well hidden. <laughs> well, and it, you know, anybody who like, you know, there are always boundaries on free speech always and in in nearly every context there's always going to be you know those really heavy lines um and i know there was some like people got mad about some french movie with little dancing girls but like i'm assuming that doesn't actually have pedophilia in it pedophilia 
hard line. Nobody is, is, is going to that because, but it's, again, if that's where the money was, if they thought that it wouldn't cause these giant shockwaves to go through and actually do them harm, they would, that's not the problem. It's, it's, it's just the money of it. And so, yeah, no, I'm just regurgitating literally what you just said very cleanly. So I'll, I will stop now. <laughs> I want to talk about the two books that you uh, announced, that two book deal. Um, what the books are called, if you, I forget if you name both of them. What, what can you tell us about them? Well, I have, I have two different books that are coming out in the next couple of years. And then there's also, well, I have a book that's only coming out in the UK um, next year. Um, that is called The Last King of California. And it is um, sort of set in, it's not a sequel to She Rides Shotgun, but it's set in the aftermath of She Rides Shotgun um, as Aryan Steel is reforming itself after kind of like the way it was torn apart, and, you know, after the events of She Rides Shotgun. Don't want to get too spoilery, but um, <laughs> that was pretty spoilery, but um. <laughs> anyway, but it's it's uh, it's all about it. It's about a family in the Inland Empire uh, who are all like, kind of like uh, generational criminals who have existed on the fringes of the outlaw world, and they are approached by Arian Steel and told basically you're going to have to pay the dime, which is uh, taxes. You know that uh, people have to pay to a to a gang. That's how gangs like that make most of their money is by charging uh, with the dime or ten percent. Um, and this family decides to stand up and not pay these Aryan steel, but it's all told from the perspective of a, of a kid, 19 year old kid named Luke, who is um, coming back to California for the first time since he was seven years old, when something horrific happened to him. And he was kind of forced to leave the family um, and, and be raised by other people. And now he's coming back and trying to decide, am I a part of this family? Am I a part of this world? Am I a criminal? Um, and do I stand with my family in this like giant war um and that for now is only being published in the uk it is darker than she rides shotgun it is Ooh. um yeah it is more literary than um she rides shotgun and i couldn't find a home for it in america um for reasons that are really kind of uh, baroque and business-based i i didn't go to a a, a smaller label I, I wanted to publish it with a major label uh, mostly because of the next book that i have that is coming out in america uh, in 2023, which is called Everybody Knows, and is a uh, a big shift in in where I, what I'm writing about. Um, I am originally from the Ozarks. I, I kind of did grow up in a a redneck white trash environment. Um, everybody knows, or I'm sorry, not everybody. It's the last King of California has a scene in it where where Luke does meth for the first time. That is directly based on my first time doing meth when I was 16. Um, so like when I write about that world, it comes from a very authentic place. Um, my hometown was the uh, national headquarters of the Hammerskin Nation, uh, which was a really violent right wing skinhead organization when I was a kid. And my my older brother ran a punk club and had run ins with them. So like when I write about like Aryan Steel and things like that, it comes from from that place. But I also have to be honest and say I've been in Hollywood now for 13 years. Um, I have worked on network TV and I've, I've lived in Los Angeles and, and uh, I can't really write about redneck dirt bags anymore it's it's too far away from me now so uh and also just i wanted to write something that, that kind of encapsulated all my interests and I, I also work in tv this is a very long prologue to this but um so like two two or three years ago 2018 um i did a pilot based on james elroy's la confidential um that we shot and filmed uh walton goggins shay wiggum were in it very excited about it. Um, Michael Dinner was the director, who's great TV director, uh, was the producing director of Justified. So like we really had the pedigree to make a really solid crime show, but it didn't sell. And I'm obsessed with James Elroy. And I had all this James Elroy energy. So what I wanted to do was write a James Elroy-esque novel, but not set in the 50s, set right now. So that's what everybody knows is, is um, it's, a, it's a big Baroque, uh, 86,000 word novel about um, Hollywood today and Los Angeles today. It has everything from like um, cele every celebrity sighting in the book is a real celebrity sighting in the place that I had it. So it's like very authentic. And, and it, you know, you go from Chateau Marmont to billionaires houses to like, um, you know, 
influencers who are who are selling steroids on the side uh, to LA sheriff's gangs and it's just like this big sweeping LA novel um that I'm super excited about and is is uh going to be published with Mulholland in a two book deal so that's the two book deal is um everybody knows in the sequel which I'm just starting to outline right now um but I think in the future that's where my storytelling is going to go for the most part is into these like kind of more LA based because I have I have been here for a long time now mm. Um, and this kind of more, it's why I started reading Le Carre was to, to get another person besides Elroy who does these very complicated plots because I wanted to kind of study that and produce one of these novels that just has a lot of turning wheels in it. That was a long explanation of my books right there. So. No, that was, that was fantastic. Um, yeah. you don't even have to reply to this, but have you heard of this publishing company, Hard Case Crimes? I have. Yeah, 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 for sure. Great Just, covers. Just throwing that out there. It wouldn't surprise <laughs> me if you ended up publishing with them one day. Um, I, I would love, I mean, everybody wants one of those covers, you know. Yeah. I, uh, I hired, and I haven't even, because uh, I don't have the wall space yet, but I have the file. I hired a, a great artist named Tony Stella, to um, who uh, you should look up on Twitter, Tony Stella. Um, and I had him do an alternate cover of She Ride Shotgun just for me, um, just because I wanted to see what he would do. But he, he does those paintings. It's not exactly the hard case style, but it's like in that realm. But I, no, I love hard case. And my friend Krista Faust um, has published with them. And uh, I, know that, I know that King throws them a novel. Uh, you know, have you ever Googled, by the way, have you ever Googled how many novels Stephen King has written? No, how many is he up to? I well, know he's... What I love about it is it says about 80. Like they don't even know. They're like, I don't know, but give or take. <laughs> give or take. I don't know. About 80. Published. Um, well, this is that's a lot of books, man. I, I, <laughs> I know. I'm never ever um hey, you guys have read his on writing, right? Yeah. I uh, there's a ton of that book that I think is really useful, but I and it, I'm about to talk some shit about Stephen King. So um it's apologies. Right. Apologies. Mark down to, the time, we'll cut it. No. <laughs> no, no. no. Um, <laughs> you don't listen to this, it's fine. Uh, and as as a preface to this, to to justify me making this comparison, I've been sober for 13 years now. But um, the way he talks about like writer's block and how you should write 3,000 words every day, and and if you can't write 3,000 words a day, are you really a writer? Um, I really think is very similar to telling somebody with a drinking problem, well, why don't you just have one beer? Like uh an yeah, alternative yeah. like yeah. it's it's like because not everybody is is the other uh, the other comparison i would say is it's like a seven foot tall guy going well, i don't know you take the basket ball and you you just put it in the basket what's hard oh, come on you just take it you put it you can hold it in one hand and you just drop it in the basket what's hard about this i think he is a freak i think he is like whatever it is that makes writing hard for the rest of us he doesn't have he's um <laughs> the way that they say like michael phelps is ocd and it helps him be able to swim laps for 10 hours a day without getting bored. Um, it's like Stephen King has some superpower that lets him just, I don't know. I, oh, I just wrote another novel. I, I don't know. Um, you know, uh, to go off of that, because I asked specifically Peter Straub, I asked him, I said, is there going to be a third uh, book to the to Black House and um, Talisman? <laughs> And to make a long answer short, he basically said, I can't keep up with Steven. Um, <laughs> I don't know how he does it. And for those that don't know, Straub's a guy that Ghost Story, I think it was. I think it was Ghost Story. Really influenced King early on. So, um, yeah, Steven told him one time if he, if he wasn't writing books, he'd be on top of a freeway scoping down cars. <laughs> now I'm paraphrasing, but basically I'm like, I, I totally get that. Um, I just pulled <laughs> up the She Rides Shotgun cover by Tony <laughs> Stella and holy shit, is that a oh. good, this guy's amazing. Yeah, he's amazing. He does a lot of like uh, movie art. He does a lot of like um, Criterion so, yeah, type Jaws, packages. Yeah, bunch he's- A bunch of Ann Fleming books. Yeah, he's really talented. And, um, oh, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I just really, you know, I love the cover to She Ride Shotgun. Um, so good. But, uh, and, and I'm not, I, I know you wouldn't use this cover to sell the book because 
it, it, it makes it look much more niche than it really is, but I just, I really wanted to see what he would do with it. So I just kind of splurged and, and commissioned that. And um, I, someday I'm going to go find somebody who can print it in like a, you know, really proper way and, and get it framed. But um, I, don't, I don't know after how I moved. would it sell. How the hell wouldn't that sell copies? Well, I, you know, look, I, I have a real um, theory that I don't, um, I don't tell other people how to do their jobs. You know what I mean? Like I, if the book people should know more about what, than I do about what book covers sell. I just, the one thing I have is like, I don't think it was them. I think it was, it was a different country's publisher that wanted me to put the word girl in the title. Cause you know, that was particularly a couple of years ago, every book was like the girl on the train, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, the blah, blah, blah. And I really fought that. And, and I really hate looking like trends, you know, like I really hate, like, like, I like, why not do things that pop? Why not do things that like make you stand out from the crowd as opposed to like, well, this is what everybody else is doing this year. So let's do that too. I just, that just gives me the creeps. And again, it gets back to that feeling I have of like, there's a million books in here. Like, let's do something to make somebody go shit. Let's pick up that book, you know? Absolutely. I get it before we wrap up. I definitely have to ask you. Um, so me and Brennan, we're from Massachusetts. Hmm. Um, I feel like you would know this guy, Whitey Bulger. Yeah, yeah. And- yeah, so outside of Massachusetts, it, it's kind of swing and mi- hit and miss. But uh, when he got, I think it was last year when um, he got transported to a prison in Virginia, he got stabbed by a hitman. Um, I mean, a growing up, because we're not too far from Boston, our, at least my father's friends, because some of them were from South Boston, from Southie, and uh, they didn't have stories about, you know, in the 70s and 80s with him. And mm-hmm. He was a myth, basically. He was Bigfoot, but a gangster. And I have had, like, I'm, I mainly dabble in, in horror, but, like, I've always had a fascination with organized crime. And it started with Whitey Bulger and um, his gangs growing up and uh, how he was in the 50s. And um, I, I, I think it's... It's really interesting. They go... Crime like that, it's gritty. Going back to the basically right in how it is like you're in about white supremacist group which she rides shotgun that shit ain't gonna be nice they're not gonna talk proper you know it's not mm-hmm. who, the, who the hell would want to buy that brandon and i actually um not to shell our stuff that's not even published but we wrote a a book first fifty thousand words started out as <laughs> as a gangster horror or whatever the hell you call it and then turned into some fucked up Wizard of Oz thing, but like <laughs> my whole point is, is throughout the whole thing, there's elements of organized crime, and I'm just so fascinated by it. Um, does it kind of prepare you or bridge life experiences, whether you actually lived through that or not? Like it, it kind but, of prepares you a little bit if some crazy shit were to happen. You mean to to have like. Um kind of grown up in like a like a criminal environment you mean to um yeah sorry that was way too vague so like the thing about books is uh or stories in general is um for at least with me with writing uh i write about horrible things that happen to kids because my biggest fear is my kid dying or Mm. something that might be worse uh that's what i can't think of anything worse than that so i mean Again, bringing it back to Paul and Nick, when we were talking to him, he said that we tend to write about the worst things that uh, we fear. And mm-hmm. I'm kind of curious how you feel about that. That was a weird way to phrase that question. <laughs> I think that, no, I think there's a tremendous amount of, of value about in that and, and, and using this kind of space to... I think even better than intentionally setting out to do that, a lot of what you learn is what it is you actually fear. Do you know what I mean? Like um, if you let yourself be dictated by your subconscious and you just write the book and then you look at it and you go, oh yeah, this is what worries me. This is the thing that like, um, I've now written at least three things uh, with fire and people dying in fires, uh, people being trapped in fires are, are a big thing for me. And I didn't realize that that was like a fear until I had to like, I look and you go, oh, wow, oh, I must have a, 
a thing about fire that particularly now that I live in California during um, climate change is, oh, really, yeah, you know, so that's a big, that, I didn't mention that earlier, the, the last king of California, um, they all live in the Inland Empire that's just to the east of Los Angeles and, um, and fire season is like a big component of the book and it's always building towards fire season is coming and then fire season comes at the worst possible time, you know, um, but you learn all sorts of things. Like I have learned, and again, this is like something I looked at my writing and said, wow, all of my characters express love through food. Um, huh. I guess that that's like a thing that I, that I do is like, I associate food and love. And that's why a, there's a tremendous amount of food in my books. Um, and, and it is often in times of like bonding or love that, that people are eating. And you just go, oh, I didn't know that about myself. Um, <laughs> You know, but like, like I said, like I am, I don't think that I am a person who writes books because if I didn't, I would be out there, you know, um, popping eyes out of skulls or whatnot. But like, I definitely, there is something in me that, that needs to deal with this violence that like, um, you know, I think I, coming from hill people and hillbillies and, and coming from people who like committed violence I, I don't think I like I said I I'm not like a, a closet tough guy I'm certainly like not but I I am completely compelled by that world and I'm compelled by being in a place where you are alive because there is danger that is a thing that I am I am fascinated with but again in real life when I'm confronted with danger I'm not like I'm not like some like gung ho let's go jump out of an airplane person um, but there's something about power. And, um, and violence that I have this like deep need to explore in, in what I write about, you know, and, um, and, you know, like I know this, everybody knows this Hollywood book is, is about um, me wrestling with the idea of if it's even ethical to work in Hollywood, um, <laughs> which is, I, I mean that very literally, it's like, I don't, it's, uh, I so, ex you. it's so exploitative it is such a system that rewards the worst people on earth. And um, that's not an accident. It's not like, oh, Hollywood is this place. And also there are bad people there. It, the, the system is built to reward like bullies and sociopaths. And, um, and I just like, I, I do spend a lot of time, you know, I don't know if you guys have been following how big a news this is outside of Los Angeles. Uh, well, I'm, I know it's news that Alec Baldwin shot somebody, you yeah. know, but the, yeah. Um, obviously working in Hollywood, this is like something we read about and I'm like fascinated by because I've been on sets with guns. I've been on sets where we've blown up, you know, trucks and, and flip trucks. Like I've been around like very dangerous things. And this thing that happened is so inexplicable, but it's also very explicable. Again, I hate to be reductive, but it really is this reductive. It was just, you read it and you go, well, oh, this 24 year old girl shouldn't have been an armorer, but they hired her because she was cheap. It was, it's all just this money. It's just, they, they cut all these corners at the end of the day, not why the girl did it or what, however the bullet showed up in the gun, but what caused it to happen was somebody didn't want to spend enough money to keep everybody safe, you know? And there, there's an incident in everybody knows that is not exactly like this, but it is about um, covering up an accident on set where somebody is badly injured, which was based on something that happened like two years ago. Um, and you know, the, the, the character who's like kind of the lead character of this book, her job is to pull the blame away from it. it what, how I said is it's uh, an attempt to, uh, her job is to separate, um, accountability from power. So like the people who actually had the power to change things cannot be the ones that we blame for this. So that's why everybody wants to blame this 24 year old girl who, by the way, did something like criminal, it sounds like. Um, but somebody else put her in that position to do that. And that person isn't going to go to jail. Um, the same way that, you know, you talk about horror, you know, about what John Landis did. Have you ever heard about the twilight zone and the people who died on that set? No. So it's, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Uh, John Landis and, and two of the producers were actually charged and went on trial for something like manslaughter. I can't remember exactly what the charge was, but they, um, they had a set where they had um, an actual helicopter hovering above um, an actor and two child actors who were there completely illegally. Um, 
And they were setting off explosions in the air around this helicopter and the helicopter lost control and crashed into the lake and the rotors actually chopped up the actor and the two children. Um, it is, it's a crazy story. And, and John Landis and those producers were very fairly put on trial for it because they had intentionally, like I said, these, these two children, at the very least, these two children were there completely illegally. Um, what they were doing, they knew it was unsafe and they actually made plans to keep the safety monitor like there was a safety agent on set and they specifically kept them away because they knew they would never be okay with this happening. And then these kids died. And, and just think about that the next time you watch a John Landis movie. Um, oh my God. But um, again, this is like this, this long, but this is like, that's what everybody knows is about in this very Baroque way is, is me processing this feeling of like, even though, I have never, I mean, I've seen some bad things. I've never seen Harvey Weinstein things, but I've seen stars be complete fucking monsters to people. I, I've had to call my boss and come apologize to a gay actor because the star was being such a homophobic asshole to them. Um, you know, I, I've been yelled at. I've seen people be, been yelled at. I've learned, you know, I, I, I'll stop here in a second, but, um, you know, you get that that experience of like, the person who yells at you every day is yelling at somebody else. And you, it's the worst feeling I can describe is like the toadies relief of like, Oh, he's not yelling at me. I'm glad he's yelling at that person. Cause it means he's not yelling at me. Mm. And, and like you, you, you have those feelings and you go, I don't know. This is, I don't know, man. I just kind of wanted to show up and tell stories. I didn't mean for <laughs> it to like, to, to get to this place. Um, sorry. That was, again, I, uh, um, but I, I, I hope that was answering your question, but I, I think my main point was that it's, I, I like to write the book and then find out what I'm scared of. I like to write the book and find out what I think as opposed to like writing a book saying what I think. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so I, I get it. I don't even remember who asked the question. Brian, <laughs> <I think> you was... <laughs> got anything uh, else, sir? No, no, if we want to lead to wrap up, I'm good with that. I was the, okay. The question would be, what are you reading? But uh, <laughs> Jordan already told us. Unless oh, I mean, the the I've got I've question. got others. Yeah. So, but oh, okay. Um, no, I mean, I guess I mean I, this is how I live my life. I just got books everywhere here. I'm reading the um, the sagas of the Icelanders, um, which is this. Like, I'm never going to read all of this. Please don't that's be a, like it's a it's a monstrous so. book. It's it's a collection of like Icelandic myths. Um, but they're like, they're not really myths. They're more just like stories about like, like, uh, farmers and warriors and things like that. Like they're adventure stories, but they're not like completely, um, unrealistic. Um, I'm, I'm rereading from hell by, uh, Alan Moore, the great graphic novel, um, That's about Jack the Ripper movie, right? Very bad movie. The, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible movie. I honestly, if I had to name the greatest comic book of all time, I would say it's from hell. Um, I like it more than uh, Alan Moore also wrote the Watchmen, but I like from hell better. Um, and uh, I've, you know, I'm reading some novels uh, that people have sent to me that aren't published yet. Um, just uh, I did a little blurb recently for uh, Sunflower by Tex Grisham. Uh, this is a great uh, book. It's got that kind of uh, old school ambition of, of being weird and pop culture and meta and funny um, in that um you know, in a way that I don't see a lot of people writing right now. Mm -hmm. um, I'm reading a, a novel uh, called The Damned Lovely by my friend Adam Frost. It's his first book. It's going to come out soon. And it's a great, it's like a throwback um, detective story, but set in modern day Glendale. And it's um, Glendale being a, a suburb. I don't know if it's a suburb. It's a city uh, right next to Los Angeles. It's actually about four blocks from where I'm sitting. And uh it's just it's it's this great mystery story um, about a down and out writer that it just feels very at home with like the classic crime novels while not being one at all. It is it's a it's a very modern story, um, and I'm reading that right now. So nice. Yeah. What, about you, what about you, Brian? Um, I just wrapped up this afternoon. I, I was reading *The Waiting* by Hunter Shea, um, and it's it's a ghost story, but it's much more. Um, it, it deals with um, uh, his, his wife having an autoimmune disease where um, 
he has to kind of take care of her at home. She's hooked up to all this machine, these machines. She's got, um, I'm, I'm, I'm blanking on the words, but uh, you know, uh, IVs and all this hospital grade stuff, but it has to be done at home. And so, I mean, it, it's, it's a love story with a ghost as opposed to a ghost story, but hmm. um, you know, for a lot of reasons it hit home for me and I, I love Hunter anyway. He, he writes a hell of a book. So um I, I i dug it i liked it a lot pat what about you um i don't have the it's on kindle i don't have the cover to show but uh christopher golden he has done a lot of novelizations uh i know buffy the vampire slayer was one that uh, a while ago now but the ghost of who you were is his latest uh collection um he's this really neat one this neat spin i i don't know if this is considered a spoiler but it's this really neat one on uh peter pan it's uh with a horrific mm-hmm. twist to it the other one mm-hmm. is uh animals by john skip and craig specter it's from the early 90s um got only a few chapters in it so far i can't really dive into what it is beyond there's lots of drugs there's animals and violence <laughs> nice <laughs> um Listeners, if you are interested in checking out our website to look at reviews, articles from previous guests, go to deadheadspace.com. Uh, and let's go to you, uh, Jordan. Final thoughts, sir. Oh, I never have final thoughts. I would say uh, <laughs> I, have a, uh, I have a newsletter called Welcome to the Hammer Party that I do not update very often um, because I really try and make it something worth reading. And so I'm, I'm never going to write one just because, oh, it's, you know, that time of the month where I crank out a newsletter. But uh, uh, some of the stuff I've said tonight, like stuff, I, I spent a lot of time thinking about writing and storytelling and things like that. Um, it's on Substack, but if you Google Welcome to the Hammer Party, um, that's out there. And uh, on that, thanks for having me on, guys. This is a really fun conversation. Yeah. Thanks for letting me uh, r- ramble. <laughs> absolutely brennan final thoughts sir yeah our our absolute pleasure man there was a lot of a lot of uh, dropped gems in there uh, really good conversation and uh I, i'm definitely looking forward to everybody knows but i really hope you also find a u.s distributor for the last king of california because that that's definitely one i'd like to read oh and it will someday and and you know i'll definitely i don't know what the legalities of this are i will definitely secure some number of copies um, from the British publisher to disseminate in the US. So, um, you know, I'll let you know, but uh, you know, it's, it's just a dumb thing about like, you don't want to put out a little book before you put out the big book. You want to just get mm-hmm. the big book out. And, and I, I, I have, a, everybody knows there's a more commercial novel and it's, it's, uh, and I'm, it's also my favorite thing I've written. I, I don't want to say it's just like commercial, like in a bad way, but, um, but thank you. I appreciate that. That sounds pretty awesome. Yeah, I just want to echo what Brent said. Thank you for coming on. It's been a real pleasure. And we would love to have you back when yep. uh, when you have a new book out, man. <laughs> well, 2022, 2023. Stay there tuned. Go. Awesome, guys. Thank you. Listeners, next episode, episode 125 is with Susan Straub. She had, she runs the program, Read to Me, also wife of Peter Straub. Uh, not sure what we talk about beyond that. We haven't recorded it yet. So that'll be out <laughs> next Monday. And listeners, as always, you have many choices in podcasts. Thank you for picking us.